Becky, should we get started? Should we get started? Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming. We're going to get started with our program because we have lots of people online as well. Students, alumni, distinguished guests, and friends from across the healthcare sector. Welcome to the second annual Health Sector Leaders Consortium hosted by the Carlson School's Business Advancement Center for Health. I'm honored to welcome you today as you gather to hear about the pressing challenges and innovations from leaders within various sectors of the healthcare system, each working to advance health equity. It's no secret that the health sector is at the heart of our economy. At $4.2 trillion, national healthcare spending makes up more than 18% of our GDP. Minnesota is a hub of innovation, research, and excellence in healthcare. And at the Carlson School, we recognize that it is our duty to take a leadership role in addressing the complex issues facing the healthcare industry. Health equity is not just a buzzword, it's our commitment. We believe that every individual, regardless of their background, should have access to high quality healthcare, but we also recognize that we can't achieve this alone. This is where Bach stands out from the rest. Bach is more than a research center. It has positioned itself as a collaborative powerhouse, bringing together an interdisciplinary expertise and fostering collaboration among academic institutions, industry leaders, and community organizations. Box initiatives, like the Interdisciplinary Health Data Competition, the Convene Conference, and the consortium we're attending today, highlight the importance of partnerships. These endeavors go beyond the boundaries of our business school and emphasize collaboration with other schools at the University of Minnesota and many partners and partner organizations in the community. Today, as you hear from these outstanding featured speakers, I encourage all of you to take and build on the collective wisdom and innovation that this event will no doubt inspire. If we combine our efforts to address the challenges of the healthcare industry to drive change, we can ensure that health equity becomes a reality for all of us. But before we invite our guests to share their insights with us, I want to introduce the founding director of the Business Advancement Center for Health and a distinguished McKnight University professor, and your host for today's consortium, Professor Panar Karacha Mandich. Her dedication to the healthcare sector and her vision for Bach have been instrumental in bringing us all together here today. Take it away, Panar. Thank you, thank you, Jamie. So this is Jamie Prankert, our new dean at the Carlson School. Uh, he's in China, otherwise we would have him here, and I hope you all get to meet Jamie. Um, so thanks for that warm welcome, Jamie, and uh, welcome to all of you. And as Jamie mentioned, I'm the founding director of BAC, Business Advancement Center for Health, and it gives me great pleasure to have you here in a virtual event. So you're here uh, in person attendees, and we have lots of people uh, virtually. So welcome to all of you attending us from around the world. Um, so I'm so pleased to see, see such a wonderful turnout and, um, and thank you so much uh, for our uh, distinction sponsors to make this event possible and that's the University of Minnesota wide new data science initiative as well as the University of Minnesota's research computing and, and the office of vice president uh, of research here at the University of Minnesota. So we're so grateful to have such uh, institutional support for the work we do here. And I also want to uh, thank our community sponsors, Minnesota Council of Health Plans, uh, the MHA program in the School of Public Health, um, as well as the Institute for Engineering and Medicine and the Office of Academic Clinical Affairs. They're all, all wonderful partners uh, to, to make this event happening. So if you want me to allow just a few minutes before uh, we have such an amazing lineup of speakers, I don't want to take their time. Um, I just want to highlight a few things uh, about the work we're undertaking at Bach. One of them is really the strength of the health sector in Minnesota that Jamie mentioned, um, as we are a sector of innovation, uh, research, and excellence here in our backyard, and, and we are so glad to embrace that. The second one is leadership in addressing healthcare challenges and, and health equity. And you hear health equity as a buzzword, AI as a buzzword in a lot of these conferences that you go that you go to. But we truly, truly mean it. We do a lot of work in it, we do research in it. One of our most recent projects is um, uh, designing and, uh, and understanding how we can change uh, through financial instruments. Uh, 
um, to address uh, long-term sustainable funding for social determinants of health factors and, and, and curating funding for community-based organizations that do this work. So we really, really take it to heart. Um, so it's um, looking forward, we're also very thrilled to share our new $1.6 million grant that we just received from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality um, to support our work on COVID-19. As some of you may know us from before, we started working on this hospitalization tracking project, March 2020, all hands on deck project. We didn't know what we were getting into and we did. And that really made us evolve in a way. So we're so excited about this new grant that is actually going to allow us to look at medication treatments during the COVID-19 where there was just such rapid flow of information and really understanding provider level factors, market level factors on and learn from that experience. Um, this consortium is, just not, is not just an event, it is also a call to action and we are very mindful and very um, true to what we wanna do here by inviting as you're gonna see the speakers from different sectors of the industry and giving them a forum to, to present their work in innovation and the challenges as they see, but at the same time come together and, and, and really uh, I hope this work continues forward as well. Um, last year our experience was all our speakers left with saying, referring to each other as they spoke because th there are these true interdependencies in our health sector. So we have terrific undergraduates here who are gonna uh, announce our speakers. So Miriam, I think you're next. And I, I thank all our volunteers, uh, staff and students that are making this event possible. Special shout out goes to Becky, our new program manager at BAG. She's not new to Carlson School, but she's working with me since May, and it's just wonderful to work with you. And Kelly and our GA, uh, you guys have been truly, truly amazing. So with that, Miriam, let's introduce our first speaker. Hi, everyone. I'm Miriam Mana. I am currently in the undergrad degree at the Carlson School of Management, studying management information systems, and I am a third year student. Today, I am introducing Michelle, um, excuse me, Michelle uh, Archambault, and she is a passionate leader in the healthcare industry for over 20 years. She graduated from Minnesota State University, University uh, with a degree in nursing, and she has worked in both direct patient care, but also in, um, and also in leadership, including training, marketing, and account management, as her current role as health director of Gentech, which she focuses on uh, multiple of portfolio of products, uh, including 40 different medicines, including different cancers, asthma, stroke, and other rare diseases. She also serves as a Gentech health equity ambassador, which aligns with her commitment to finding solutions to ensure equitable health care for all. In her free time, she also likes to um, spend time with her family, travel, and enjoy music. Let's give a round of applause for Michelle. Thank you, Miriam. Can you hear me? Yes? Can you hear me in the back? Perfect. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction. I appreciate that. Um, and thank you to Bach and Pinar for the invite um, to this program. I really appreciate the panel that we're gonna hear from and being able to just give everybody a little insight into Genentech and how we support health equity, both at a corporate level as well as a local level. Um, so I'll just start really quick of the little story of why health equity matters. Um, so back in 2020 during COVID, um, with all the changes and the, just all the stress that was going on, I personally had some chest pain I shouldn't hit that, I suppose. Um, some chest pain, and I thought, should I go in, should I not go in? At the same time, one of my um, colleagues also had chest pain, and we both ended up going in to get it looked at. We went in, we got it taken care of, I went back, she went back, we were both fine. The difference is, in her story, um, both professional women, both great healthcare, great healthcare companies, she, after they found out she was fine, started asking her questions. Did you really have chest pain? Were you coming in fight, trying to find drugs? And things like that. Shocking, very shocking to me. The only difference between me and her is I'm a white woman, she's a black woman. Again, very similar jobs, great health insurance, great health care. 
That to me just put an exclamation point on health equity and why we need to do something. So it's not just, you know, we think of sometimes on health equity work, it's people that are poor and things like that. That is not the case. Health equity is everybody needs to have equitable access no matter where you live, no matter what your race is, your ethnicity, your socioeconomic status, anything like that. So I'm very passionate about this, and I love the fact that I'm with a company that's also very passionate and supports this work. So, um, so to get started, I always like to start with what is the cost of not doing anything with health inequities, right? Is there a cost? There's a huge cost to the healthcare system. Um, so we don't have any current health economic data um, to support this, but we do have historical data. And if you extrapolate that for inflation, you can see that the direct cost of health inequities for direct medical costs is about $229 billion. That's a lot. That's just in healthcare costs. If you look at all the indirect costs, um, which include uh, like care, premature death, loss of productivity, that's over a trillion dollars. Um, and so there is a huge impact to the overall healthcare ecosystem if we don't address health inequities. Um, so we believe that health inequities are impacted by social determinants of health, and that's throughout a person's lifetime. Um, so if you look at the patient journey, you think of um, Genentech, we're a drug company, right? We think of like when they hit the healthcare system, what their treatments are, and what their outcomes are. What I love is Genentech's looking earlier. How do we look at people before they even get into the healthcare system? How do we empower people to get screened um, and get it really empower them to engage in the healthcare system earlier? Because we know the earlier you get diagnosed, the earlier treatment you have, the less cost it is to you and the healthcare ecosystem as well. So um, we do a lot of partnering or try to do partnering to look at how do we um, do screening, which means we'd like to work with managed care companies, employers, healthcare system, advocacy groups, anyone who's looking at doing this work to again get people into the healthcare system earlier so that they can get treated at a, a time where they won't lose their productivity and again, the cost of care is less. Um, so when we looked at health equity, we had to look and look internally and say, if we're gonna do this work externally, we have to look internally and say, how are we doing internally? Um, and so we have a diversity and inclusion approach to everything we do health equity wise. Um, and it goes down to these three pillars. So we need to foster belonging. We need the employees that work here to actually um, be engaged. Um, that way we can recruit the best diverse talent. We can retain that talent. And then we can be very respectful when we have these conversations um, throughout our system. Um, we also need to advance inclusive research. So being a drug company, right, we need to have representation from all sectors um, when we're doing discovery into our clinical trials. So we've been very strategic in making sure that we um, are seeking underprivileged groups to be part of our um, uh, clinical trials. And we've done some specific trials in certain populations that we haven't studied in, in the past with medications that are currently available. And then transform society. So we're looking to partner with people to think differently, to think outside the box. What does that look like? It's not the typical healthcare that we think of in the past. There's things that we can do differently, and especially if we gauge all sectors of a healthcare system, and actually people outside the healthcare system, right, that look at things a little bit differently. Some of us get very siloed in the way we think. And so how do we transform um, how we look at healthcare? Um, so back in 2020, uh, we also, as Genentech, thought, um, let's do a trial and look and see um, what health equity and um, some of the uh, problems that exist within health equity. So we launched this landmark health equity study and we interviewed 2,200 patients. Um, and our goal was to look and see how they engaged with the healthcare system, the US healthcare system, and what were their experiences with the healthcare system. We took that same cohort and one year later interviewed them all again to just see, you know, had it gotten better, worse, what did that look like? What we found out is um, about 52% of the patients that we considered medically disenfranchised believed that the, the system was flawed and actually out to get them. Um, so there's this, all this medical distrust. I'm sure you guys know the history of all the medical distrust and things that have gone on. So this is 2020. This is 
this is current. So people are, are still feeling that distrust within the healthcare system. And because of that, one in three of the medically disenfranchised patients, they don't participate in clinical trials, which doesn't help. They don't get vaccinated, and they don't get the testing they need, including preventative screening. Um, so a year later, we interviewed them again, and unfortunately, we got the same results, right? People still continued to feel like the, the system was rigged against them, and a lot of them stopped going to appointments, stopped seeking care, just because they just felt like there was not that trust and that respect of them coming into the system. Um, so with all of this, uh, in 2021, after all that study, looking internally and doing the study, we actually put together a health equity strategy. So people had been doing this work, but what we realized is people were doing great work in New York and Minnesota and um, California, but it was so siloed and nobody was talking to each other. Um, and so there's synergies, right, when you talk to, to each other. So we put together um, a health equity strategy, and it was based on Roche, 10 years vision to provide three to five times more benefit to patients at 50% less cost. And it's uh, revolved around these three pillars. And just a little background, so Genentech is actually part of the Roche umbrella. So Roche is a global company and has companies underneath it. Genentech is the US-based pharmaceutical company under Roche. Um, so our strategies was really so that we could align uh, we could build capabilities, and we could have some more operational um, efficiencies and governance when we did this work so that we weren't in silos anymore and that we were sharing what we were doing so we weren't necessarily reinventing the wheel but um, leveraging what other people were doing to um, increase this work. So um, back to embedding representation, that was one thing as well. Representation matters. We found, too, that physicians that looked like the community, people had... Um, more, thank you. Or <laughs> uh, more comfortable going into people to um, doctors that look like them, um, and then building trust in the community. I can't forget this one. This is probably the most important. Um, is you need to work with the community. You need to go out, spend time, listen, learn. Most of the time, communities know what's best for them, and they have the answers. They just need someone to come and empower them. Or maybe they need health um, literacy materials in their own language that's more culturally sensitive. Um, so we all know building trust is huge. Um, so really quick in closing, these are some of the partnerships from a corporate level that we've done um, with Genentech. So one of them is called Love Letters. We worked with some patients of black and Latinx descent to talk about their relatives to getting screened because um, a lot of times people put their, their own health care last. Um, and really, we need people to put their health care first because they need to be there for their families. And so it's a little bit of a different mind shift. Um, I'll just mention really quick here locally as well, we've worked with SHAC, which is the Somali Health Advisory Council, um, and then one of our health systems to do Somali liver cancer awareness, which is in Somali language on Somali TV. Um, and then we've also done some stuff with the Native American community. Um, we had an ad board last year talking about, like, where are the gaps? Where are the disparities? Where could we potentially play? Um, from that, we're doing some additional roundtables moving forward and a white paper as well. So, so in closing, uh, really quick, the goal of Genentech is really to envision a world where all individuals can experience their full potential in health and well-being, and that science is more diverse, um, inclusive, and equitable. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I run out of time. We may have maybe uh, time for like one or two questions, and then we will um, also have a networking at the end. So any questions for Michelle? And um, what we need to do is uh, walk around the mic because we have people online. And Thank you, Michelle. I'm Don Bina with GE Healthcare. So my question is about when you did the 2020 and the 2021, were there any interventions or are you just taking two snapshots in time? And if you are, then I would expect that that data would be very similar. We didn't have any intervention. It was two snapshots in time just to see if the healthcare, because health equity is a buzzword, right? So not in us intervention, but just the healthcare system and see what that would look like. So you're correct. All right. I'll be here. You can all find But me thank after. you so much, Michelle. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, we are going to move on to our next speaker and to introduce. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
<laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Ariel Fernandez. I'm a senior and an undergrad here at the Carlson School. I'm majoring in marketing and entrepreneurial management. Um, our next speaker is Andrew Danielson. He received his BS in biochemistry and molecular biology from the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire and his MS in molecular biology from Mayo Clinic Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. Currently, he serves as the chair of Mayo Clinic Ventures in the Department of Business Development at Mayo Clinic, where he oversees licensing, technology development, venture investment, and business development functions. Prior to joining Mayo Clinic Ventures in 2002, Mr. Danielson conducted research at Mayo Clinic, um, where he worked to identify therapeutic targets in breast and ovarian cancer. Please welcome Andrew Danielson. Well, thank you for that. And as noted, it's my distinct privilege to work at Mayo Clinic. And for shameless plug, I'm here to convince at least some of you that it's a fantastic place to work, filled with unbelievable people and an unmatched mission. And as we'll hear from our, our panel, that mission is to bring the best health care to everyone. And I'm here to convince you that Mayo practices the best health care, but we need your help in bringing it to everyone. That's an unmet portion of our mission. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of Mayo Clinic. I'm going to talk about innovation and specifically how we are trying to accomplish that at Mayo. A little bit about Mayo Clinic Ventures. That'll be shameless plug number two for these folks. Our strategy at Mayo, our 2030 strategy, which is a, it fits very well with equity, disparities in care. How can we bring the best care to everyone in a manner that's low friction? And then I hope I get to it. If I don't catch me afterwards, um, scaled innovation. That's how we're going to do everything everyone here is talking about. So Mayo Clinic, and I know we're in Minnesota, so we're, you know, it's illegal to talk about and brag about good things about ourselves. That's, that's only East and West Coast. Midwest, you can't do that. But we are sitting in a state with the number one healthcare system that humanity's ever created. There's not better health care than you can get 90 miles south, and that's measured by multiple independent bodies. We'll get to that in a second. Pretty amazing and pretty spectacular, especially if you've ever driven down to Rochester, middle of nowhere. By, by no rights should it be there, but it is in, in a pretty special place. Um, so ranked number one, we'll talk about that. And, and here's the good and the bad. The bad is that, that first number, 1.3 million unique patients seen every year at Mayo Clinic. That has to change. Because if you're one of the fortunate few, you get excellent care and your life is changed. And if you're the other 8.9 billion people, you don't get that, and that's what we have to fix. And I'm here to tell you that we are on the cusp, I believe, with the technology and capabilities to, to bring that care to everyone. You can look at the rest, and I don't know if you have these slides, but you can read that. Um, so again, Mayo Clinic by US News Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, LeapFrog, any measure the best health care that's ever existed in history and humanity. And it's not actually even particularly close, as you can see here. So that's outstanding. And again, the last bragging I'll do so I don't get arrested by the Minnesota NICE police. But again, fantastic if you're one of the one million patients who can get that. And it's embarrassing that we can't bring that to everyone else, something we must fix. So that's part of Mayo's 2030 strategy set by our board. How do we take what is just truly excellent health care and we bring that to everyone, cure, connect, transform. We're curing diseases down in Rochester, but we need to connect with everyone else. And by doing that, we're transforming health care. And so here's where I step back. And this is also, it was an education for me, so you think innovation. So we're going to do that through innovation. And you say, well, but wait a second, what is innovation? In my mind, it was like sticky notes on a wall and thinking up cool ideas. That's only the front half. And that's the challenge to all of us. It's, yeah, you can talk about this, and you can think about ideas. But it's the practical implementation of those ideas that matter. It's when we get tangible with products and services that can address disparities in care and health inequities. And one of the founding brothers of Mayo Clinic when he talked about what is Mayo Clinic, it's turning ideas into action. That's when we accomplish our mission. 
So I'll go over this really fast too, shameless plug number two, Mayo Clinic Ventures is a great place to work if you want to do cool things at the intersection of ideas into action. Um, whatever else you think of our world, we're in a capitalist society where we have to allocate dollars to create products and services to impact patient lives. And Mayo Clinic Ventures is a special place within a special place because we're the bridge between the idealism of Mayo Clinic and the great things we do clinically and the ideas we generate and working with industry partners to turn those into products and services like Genentech does, which we have licensed intellectual property to Genentech. Um, so Mayo Clinic is also very good at coming up with ideas and getting those in the hands of partners. I will draw your attention to 312 startups. Um, the U of M does a very good job, by the way, as well, in developing intellectual property and commercializing it. Um, Mayo Clinic does this better than MIT. It does it better than Stanford. Might be a surprise to you all, but it's also true. So Minnesota is a place where innovation can happen. Ideas, startups, products, and services change lives. I am going to skip this. This is what we do at Mayo Clinic Ventures every day. It's rainbows and unicorns every day in our office. <laughs> so um, how do we take the best care in the world and get it to everyone? And the answer is pretty easy. All of us know it. Half of you are holding it in your hand. We use digital tools and services. If there's one thing every other industry has taught us, is that if you can take things and digitize it and use technology, you make products better and cheaper at the same time. That's happened in almost every industry. It has not happened in healthcare, and it's our job to, to do that. Uh, Mayo's doing part of it. Um, I, again, don't ever Google, don't ever think, I have a stomach ache, I'm gonna Google stomach ache, and then you'll, you know, you'll be up at 3 a.m. convinced you have, you know, whatever the strangest disease you've ever heard of. Go to mayoclinic.org. It's always very sober and rational healthcare information. And so we've done that in part through how to educate you all about your own healthcare. We've been able to scale that. So a billion people are able to access what I'd call evidence-based, sober, you know, don't scare yourself, medical information. So we, we can do this. That's the front end education. But now we have to get to actual caring for patients actually delivering care, addressing those disparities. This is a company that we've started. Um, we've launched this product with a, a large pharmaceutical company who is applying it to all 80,000 of their employees. If that pilot goes well, we hope to take it to the world. Again, I'm super privileged to get my care at Mayo Clinic, and it's a pain in the butt. Right, going in to try and get care, right? You gotta, you gotta take time off of work, you gotta drive to wherever you're going, you gotta wait in the waiting room for at least 75 years. They call your name, someone sees you, then you sit there for another whatever. Like, it's just, we have to be able to do better. So this company is again, how do we take the care and make it digital? So what you have here, and again, this is real and this is happening and COVID's helped us with this. It's starting an infectious disease, but we're gonna take it to all, nearly all, indications, test kits that you can buy or get for free with your insurance that you can pick up or have delivered through DoorDash right to your door. I'm not feeling very good. Maybe I have COVID. I'm going to call up DoorDash. It's going to show up, $5, and we've all you know, swabbed our nose, which feels worse than COVID sometimes. And then I'm going to take a test. I'm going to take a picture of it with my phone. It's going to go to asynchronously, meaning you know it'll happen when it's ready for you. So if this is at 2 in the morning, that's OK. A healthcare provider is going to review your test results. And you can have a consult based on care plans developed by Mayo, which are just care algorithms, if this, then, if watch out for this, and this, that, and the other thing. I don't even know. Um, but developed by you know, great physicians then you will, if needed, right, here's your Paxlovid prescription, you do have COVID, and it's okay for you to take it because you don't have kidney issues or whatever else. Uh, instant billing to your insurance, e-prescription sent to an online pharmacy, DoorDash shows up, here's your Paxlovid, you've never had to leave your house. If you're in Minneapolis, all that could happen in three hours. And that's what healthcare should be, because it doesn't matter if you're in Mayo's network, it doesn't matter if you can get into Mayo Clinic, it doesn't matter if you have a car or anything, right? It, it all just should work like that. That's how the rest of our, I can order a pizza that way, but I can't get healthcare that way, and that's an indictment of all of us, I suppose. 
Um, but this is real and this is happening and we're piloting it and we're hoping to bring it out to the rest of the world. This is an example of, of some of the work we're doing. I'm gonna skip this really fast, uh, but Mayo's Clinic's also taking all of its data, uh, eight million longitudinal patient records, de-identified it, put it what we call behind glass, meaning not sharing the data itself, but allowing companies like Genentech and others to come in and access that data to develop artificial intelligence algorithms, which is important for the next thing I'm gonna tell you. Um, hopefully there's no doctors in the house and I probably will get fired if this is being recorded. But a lot of what Mayo Clinic doctors do can easily be done by artificial intelligence today, right now. And that's why, where it's gonna get super exciting here in a second. Um, I don't know how many of you use GPT. Ariel told me that it writes all of her papers for her. So I, <laughs> is that illegal in college? Is that? She didn't say that, but she probably is using it, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's amazing what can be done. But here's what's even more amazing. So this is Microsoft and OpenAI, who Mayo is working with a bit, but it passes the US medical licensing exam by a mile, better than really almost every doctor. And you'd say, oh, that's whatever, a computer can do whatever. It can do differential diagnosis. It can, do med it can explain medical reasoning. It can explain to medical students why a, why a diagnosis was made and what it means. It, it can do that right now. This is from March, by the way. GPT-5 is, uh, well, GPT-5 will be available in, in December. Um, and you say, that's fine, but I wanna see a human. But if you, uh, if you have other humans interact electronically with humans and, and AI, the humans significantly like the AI better because it's not late for lunch and it's not having a bad day. And right, it has, I, I kid you not, the AI has more empathy than humans, which you know, is also an indictment of all of us. I had minor road rage on the way up here. Um, so this, I probably, well, before I get to this, this is the end of it. So um, Mayo has the best healthcare in the world, but here's what's really interesting. We don't have any medications from Genentech that you can only get at Mayo. And we don't have any medical devices from Medtronic that you can only get at Mayo. And we don't have any diagnostic equipment from GE Healthcare that you, can, that you can only get at Mayo. So every hospital everywhere has the same tools, but we get wildly different results in our healthcare. And you'd say, why is that? And I would submit to you that we have 4,000 neural networks at Mayo that we call humans that walk around and read the literature and talk to each other and are smart people, and they say, oh, I know how to use these tools to get really good healthcare results. That doesn't scale. It scales to about a million patients a year. Again, embarrassing. We can now build a neural network that scales infinitely, is never late for lunch, and is never having a bad day, and it can do pretty good. So it is incumbent on Mayo Clinic to package up its knowledge on how to deliver and practice this best healthcare, put it into something that scales infinitely. And what happens when you can scale something infinitely? It gets cheap because you can now access it anywhere, anytime, anyone. And by doing that, I, I, I think we are very close to, you can, live, you can live anywhere, but you can certainly live in areas of the country who certainly don't have access to Mayo Clinic and they can get Mayo Clinic level care for wherever they go to get their care, hopefully even in their home. And so this is, the la this is what got me, like, you don't know how fired up I was in March when I read this. So random IT guy on Twitter who was using GPT-4, which was trained on trash data, meaning just, I don't know, random internet healthcare data, and his dog was sick and he loved his dog. And so he took it to the vet the vet said, oh, you got a tick-borne illness, take this whatever drug, and your dog will be better. And, and he did, and the dog got kind of better, but not all the way better. And he goes back to the vet, and the vet's like, I don't know, right? Wait for your dog to get better. Probably didn't say it that sassy, but I'm imagining that it was. And so the guy's like, oh, I don't care. I'm gonna go on GPT-4. And he puts in his dog's labs. These are his labs and the uh, symptoms, GPT-4, does a differential diagnosis, six possible causes, and the guy's like, okay, wait a second, what, what if I thought it was, well, in cutting to the chase, the, the red box, the first two things GPT-4 thought it was, was in fact what it was. Um, but the guy's like, well, okay, um, 
if you thought it was one of those two, what test should I order to differentiate between the two? And GPT says, well, I would do the 4DX test, and that would tell me, again, the next step, I don't even know, I'm not a doctor. But what the dog had was a tick-borne illness that had to be treated, and then that tick-borne illness caused an autoimmune anemia. So it was sort of stacked on stacked, which is why the first vet couldn't figure it out. But GPT4 did, so he goes back to the second vet and says, I wanna be treated for the tick-borne illness and hemolytic anemia. Here's your two medications, gives it to his dog, dog's all better. And he, and, and he you know, this does all the screenshots on Twitter. Again, this is in March. So you look at something like that and you're like, we can now do this. We can take Mayo Clinic data, which is the best ever, and we can put it in AI, and we can create an infinitely scalable, smartest physician ever, and anybody can use it anywhere. And anytime you get that type of scale, costs go down, improved performance, and we address disparities in care. It's, it's simply that easy. I mean, million miles in between, and we need groups like Best Buy, and United, and Genentech, and Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic absolutely cannot do this on its own. We need smart young people who are going to do this for us. But I would say for the first time in my 28 years at Mayo, it's like, it, it's possible to do this now. It's, we've got real world evidence, if you will, that this can be done. Um, so thank you. You want or two questions? Uh, thanks for the great presentation. So my understanding is that uh, Mayo's policy is to provide healthcare services through AI, DoorDash, at-home services. Uh, so what would happen to uh, yeah. that? <laughs> what would happen to that human touch? Because that's certainly a need for patients. And uh, I can, uh, I think that computers can't create a formula to solve all the problems in healthcare industry. And uh, actually, there are studies that show that. Uh, Telehealth would uh, increase the disparities in healthcare. So, how do you manage that? Thank you. It can if we're not careful. So, if if telehealth requires high speed internet and a phone, and right, there's still people who don't have those things. So, we absolutely have to be careful about that. Um, so, it's not like this is a layup. I sounded like that, but it's not. You're absolutely right. Healthcare is a very personal thing. We always say at Mayo, we're we're interacting with people on the on likely the worst day of their life. They're scared, right? It's, it's, you want a human interaction. So this isn't to say that there won't be any humans involved. It is to say if you live in, I don't want to pick on a place. Um, well, if you live in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, which I can pick on because I'm from there, and you're seeing a physician, whatever physician you see, that physician could be as good as any person at Mayo Clinic. So you're still seeing a human but it's much more scalable than coming to Mayo Clinic. And you can see a human who probably doesn't have to have gone to medical school and specialized and everything else. So you could see a nurse, you could see a physician assistant. And again, that allows us to scale great healthcare. Doesn't mean humans aren't involved. It means humans are augmented. Because I 100% agree with you, you are going to need humans involved in healthcare. But I would challenge you that the way we're doing it now is fundamentally broken and absolutely has to change in some form or fashion. Okay, maybe we can take one more question. Hi, Andrew, thank you for coming. Um, my name's Eric, I'm a first year MHA student here. Um, and I'm just curious about your um, test to treat initiative. Um, how does Mayo deal with fraud and fake tests and um, you know, kind of people looking to get those medications or treatments that don't actually need them. People getting tests and treatments that they don't need? Yeah, so if they were to submit like a fake test where, you know, like maybe they wanted Adderall and they could kind of oh, I get see. a fake Game test and get that, get yeah. that medication. Uh, that's an interesting question and a good one because I've not thought about that before. If you were to implement tests to treat in home-based care, how do you stop people from gaming the system? That is an awesome question. So I somehow manipulate the system that my leg really hurts and I get fentanyl delivered to my door and it goes out the back door. Um, I don't know. 
I would say you should send me an email and come up with ideas and help us, <laughs> and help us develop that. You're smarter than I am, yeah. That we is have a wonderful question. students at the University of Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> and we have now Greta who's gonna introduce our next speaker. Thank you so much, Andy. <laughs> Hello everyone, thanks for being here today. My name is Greta Cole, I'm a current junior here at the Carlson School and I study supply chain and operations management. Uh, today I'll be introducing Brett Edelson, who has been with United Healthcare since 2005. He currently serves as the CEO of United Healthcare for the Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota regions, um, where he leads the team serving 900,000 members across the states. Prior to this role, Brett worked in the national leadership position across United Healthcare, including senior vice president of its community and state Medicaid business, where he leads teams focused on product, consumer experience, strategic planning, dual special needs plans, and medical proposal development. Early in his career, Brett worked at the strategy and operations practice at Deloitte Consulting, where he advised clients on strategy and business performance. He received his MBA from the University of Chicago, um, MS in Healthcare Delivery Science from Dartmouth College, and a BA in Political Science from Washington University in St. Louis. Brett has served on the Board of Directors for the Science Museum of Minnesota, Hennepin Health Foundation, Close Gaps by Five, American Cancer Society of CEOs Against Cancer, and has been a mentor through Techstars and Envold. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Brett today. Thank you, Greta. Just, I'm on, right? Good, all right, you always have to check first. Uh, also, a big thank you to Panar and Becky. Uh, in addition to putting on this amazing program, you should know they make it so easy to participate, which is huge. So thank you so much for your generosity and everything you did to get everything set up. Uh, and also, a big thank you to our panelists. Uh, I am probably the most proud Minnesotan you can possibly be. And when I look at and hear from uh, the other panelists, you just realize how special Minnesota is uh, to have all these wonderful leaders and the organizations that they represent and making the impact that they do. And, and the amazing thing is we're not all of them. And there's even more uh, amazing organizations that aren't even represented today. So I'm looking forward to uh, having a little bit of time with you. I thought I could do two different things. First, I just want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing in trends post-pandemic. Uh, and then I thought that I could just share a little bit about United Health Group in particular, how we approach sustainability. Um, because, as Andrew said, one of our goals is to recruit you, and I thought no better way uh, to recruit uh, young minds and up-and-coming leaders than to talk about how we approach sustainability, because it's so important uh, to ensuring that the next generation of, of healthcare is delivered in an even more, more meaningful way. All right. Um, so first, I want to talk a little bit about post-pandemic healthcare trends, because as everyone knows, healthcare changed a lot. Uh, during the pandemic, and in particular, how people engage in the healthcare system. Um, so uh, a couple things that uh, we started to notice during the pandemic. Um, behavioral health. Behavioral health didn't just start when the pandemic started, but two things happened. Uh, one, there was more anxiety and depression, but then even more importantly, and if you know, there was one positive outcome from the pandemic, people started talking about it. You know, I think I personally realized this when Michael Phelps became a spokesperson for one of the uh, national telehealth behavioral health organizations. There was just more visibility to that behavioral health is tantamount to health. And that was something that was really important that happened during the pandemic. Uh, a second big trend that happened is people delayed care. This happened uh, across many different populations in many different areas, but in particular, uh, around orthopedics and cardiology. And then there were many people also delayed primary care and delayed immunizations, which had a big impact on kids. So there was a lot that kind of we had to, and we still are catching up on. Uh, and then the last, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, is around virtual care. People tried it, and they really liked it. And that uh, made us, as a healthcare ecosystem, realize that we can probably change things a little bit. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later. So before we get to that, just kind of going back, and Andrew kind of touched on this a little bit today, but even more so kind of pre-pandemic, people kind of accepted that this is how it worked when you wanted to see the doctor. Um, it took about a month to get an appointment. Uh, you drove there. Once you got there, you checked in. Uh, if you were lucky, you went right to an exam room. Uh, once you got to the exam room, you probably waited around 18 minutes before you saw a PCP, and this is for primary care. 
Uh, and oh, by the way, if you need a same day appointment, there was maybe a one in 10 chance you would get it. I think people stopped accepting that. And they realized that there was probably a better way um, because this just wasn't acceptable as we think about just other ways that people experience other consumer things. So insert virtual care. And so some interesting statistics about virtual care and what happened kind of pre and post pandemic. There was a 1,700% increase in virtual visits from 2019 to 2022. Uh, and what's interesting though is most of these were done by local providers. So it wasn't just that individuals were going to these national organizations like Doctor on Demand or Amwell or Teladoc. They were seeing their doctors, their local doctors virtually. I know I started to do this during the pandemic. I, um, I'm okay sharing this, it is, it's, it's, it is HIPAA, but it's my personal HIPAA. Uh, I went to a doctor for an in-person appointment. Uh, he had prescribed me a statin and he said, we have to do a follow-up appointment in 30 days. But you can do that appointment over Zoom. So we did that. It was actually the first time I'd ever done a virtual appointment. And it saved me about an hour. The appointment was five minutes. I had gone in to do some labs and uh, but rather than staying and waiting uh, in, 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 the, in the weight room, I, by the way, I was able to do the labs at kind of an off-peak hour. I was able to then get the results and have the discussion about next steps online. I loved it. Like it's something that I never would have considered before the pandemic and something that's just kind of how things are done now because 95% of those visits are done with local care providers. But probably the single biggest area that's had the biggest impact from telehealth is around behavioral health. Uh, and you know, this stat here is that 53% of telehealth visits for behavioral health, and actually I've seen locally in Minnesota, it's, it's, it's about 10% higher, uh, were virtual versus about 1% before the pandemic. And the great thing about that is there's a huge barrier to seeking any sort of care. Um, but behavioral health, probably more than any other specialty, they had no-shows and others that didn't show up. With virtual care, that has almost gone away. So that's a wonderful aspect to be able to support individuals where they're at to get that access, that ongoing access. To we're, only, we're already down to only five minutes? This goes by so fast. That's, I may just, um, I'm gonna skip a couple things because wearables, but we'll just go right into um, <laughs> sustainability. Because I think sustainability is so important and, and I really do mean it. If there's one reason why you're gonna work for United Health Group, it's about what we're doing for sustainability. And so first, what we think uh, as sustainability, if folks have heard of ESG, the environment, social, and governance issues, that's what we call our approach to ESG. Uh, and we have it highly linked to our mission, which is to help people live healthier lives and make the health system, healthcare system work better for everyone. There's kind of an external and internal uh, set of outcomes we think about uh, as it pertains to sustainability. From an external perspective, we think a lot about a modern, high-performing healthcare system working with uh, so many organizations on delivering that care, as well as uh, not so much in Minnesota, but in other places delivering directly through uh, some of our uh, 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 direct care. But then also a healthy environment. The second piece internally, um, which we have made huge investments on, is around people and culture. It's how we hire, how we recruit, how we uh, excuse me, uh, retain, how we recruit, and that's with the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and then it also includes responsible business practices. Um, we've made a lot of commitments, which I'm not going to go through, around where we're going to be between, 20, uh, th uh, between 2025 and 2035. Oh, I got the five minute. That's a, oh, well, well, that's good. That's, well, adopted. Well, that's good. Well, I can't go back because I don't think I'm allowed to, so we'll just have more time for questions. Uh, so around a, a high-performing healthcare system, uh, some of the things that, that we've done over the past few years, which I'm super proud of, is we made $0 co-pays for a series of life-saving drugs. So things like EpiPens and insulin on our fully insured plans, those have zero out-of-pocket costs, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, we have also been ramping up bringing care to the home. So we have a program called House Calls. It's primarily delivered in our Medicaid and Medicare population. We're two million times a year, we send an individual nurse practitioner to primarily meet seniors in their home to understand the environment that they live in and to close gaps in care, which I think is also a really unique program. And also we've been working on building healthier communities. So locally, one of my favorite initiatives that we've worked on uh, is as Fairview uh, started to reimagine the way that St. Joseph's Hospital was used. Um, we were along for the ride, they led it, but just thinking through how could that be reimagined into a health and wellness hub. And we provided some resources of individuals who had done that work in other geographies and be able to bring that to Minnesota. Uh, the next is around the healthy environment. One of my favorite United Health Group statistics, and this isn't something to be proud of, unlike all the male statistics, is we are the single largest customer of the US Postal Service. 
because of all of the EOBs uh, and enrollment forms and everything else that we create. We actually um, are creating literally billions of pieces of paper every year. And so far, uh, we've been able to reduce a billion pieces of paper a year. And I believe we are still the highest user of the USPS, but it is proportionally going down. Um, our goal is to become net zero and to do that not only through paperless initiatives, uh, but locally on our buildings, we've put um, solar panels on as well as ensuring that any new building that we have is LEED certified. Uh, finally, uh, around our people and our culture. Uh, I am really proud to say I think we have a very inclusive culture. Uh, and I think that shows up every day because we believe that diversity leads to performance and having an environment where everyone can bring their best, best self to work, that's how we, uh, how we succeed. We've also been recognizing that people work in very different environments. That's something else that changed in our pandemic. Uh, some individuals choose to work in an office, some need to by necessity work in a clinic, but many others work at home. And you have to support an individual's well-being based on the, that environment that they work in and then also how they work uh, with other colleagues. Uh, we're very proud that we, uh, as an organization, have uh, implemented many employee research groups, resource groups to help connect and um, uplift uh, historically marginalized populations. Um, we have eight of them uh, around, um, uh, uh, around supporting Native Americans, African Americans, Asians, those through disability inclusion, uh, pride at UHG, uh, spouses of military and veterans, and through Women Lead. And that makes a huge difference for individuals to be able to not only connect with others who have other lived, excuse me, similar lived shared experiences, but then others who want to gain a deeper appreciation. Uh, finally, around responsible business practices, uh, some of the things which I'm most proud of that we worked on uh, is around investing in diverse suppliers. So every year we invest about five, excuse me, over the past 10 years we've invested about $5 billion in organizations that are owned uh, by minorities and we continue to grow that uh, each year. Uh, and then also we have uh, lots of work, interestingly um, with some of the examples that Andrew gave, around ensuring that we have responsible use of AI and machine learning knowing that's gonna be such a more uh, bigger piece of how healthcare evolves moving forward. So because I got a second five, I actually have a full five minutes of questions, which may make me the star of the show. Awesome. See, we, this is the tactic we like. We just follow, we show first, yeah. this, and then the speaker speeds up. Um, so we have questions, we can take a few questions for Brett. Thank you for the presentation. So uh, what do you think would be the impact of expanding healthcare services with lower cost on uh, small and independent businesses in healthcare, like into independent pharmacies, for instance, uh, what would happen to them? Yeah, there, there's um, a lot of challenges with, you know, generally speaking, expanding healthcare. So kind of two answers to that question. The independent pharmacist as an employer, uh, that their costs keep on going up each year in an unsustainable way. You know, when I think about things like the GLP-1 drugs, like Wagovi, uh, and like what's that gonna be the impact in the future? Uh, but then also as you continue to become more affordable, how do you engage, as in your example, like pharmacies to deliver the healthcare most locally? Sometimes they're the individuals that know the community the best, they know the patients the best, and you wanna to continue to support that. So I think that that's part of attention in healthcare that no organization has truly perfected, but we have to continue to acknowledge to support both. Uh, both affordability, but then also knowing that quality is sometimes delivered uh, oftentimes delivered by those who are closest to the patient. Hi, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, just a little bit on addressing the healthcare challenges with all the shortage in uh, healthcare skilled workers and nursing staffs. Uh, what are you seeing the trends and how do you see that solving that problem? Our, of the, the shortages and in the, in the nursing staff and clinical but, staff. Well, I, and it, it's, a, it's a huge problem for many aspects of the healthcare system. It's, it's actually something we work on with, with health partners, uh, is that the number of individuals that need home care and skilled nursing facilities to transition out of the hospital, as that number has decreased, as the number of beds has decreased, as the number of uh, individuals uh, that are offering home health decreases, that's had a huge burden on hospitals, where those individuals are staying in the hospital much longer than they ever had before, which then creates downstream impacts to many other aspects of operating a hospital. Uh, I think within Minnesota, we're on the precipice of some really good things to help. 
Um, the state legislature has provided some additional dollars for nursing homes. There's also, it looks like uh, some additional dollars is gonna come in for home health for Medicaid that hopefully will start to resolve the issue by attracting more individuals uh, to those lines of service. Uh, the other thing which not many people are talking about, and this is certainly not uh, United Healthcare position, but just personally, um, as a country, uh, immigration has become a lot different over the past five years. And a lot of individuals who typically provide those services are those coming from other countries. And as the number of people decreased, that had a huge impact. And then you add on top of it retirements and then just the general healthcare worker shortage. All those things have kind of created this perfect storm of, of issues. Good afternoon. Um, earlier this year, United Healthcare announced that it was decreasing its prior authorization requirements by about 20%. It, that was applauded, and I'm wondering where you see that going, and do you think the company will expand its list of requirements that don't require prior authorization? I think it has huge potential, uh, and you know, 20% may not seem like a lot, but for those individuals who are working in the healthcare ecosystem that are, are working in some of those administrative areas, like that's a huge, a huge burden that's lifted. Uh, I think as we continue to get in more data and realize that oftentimes, and Minnesota is a great example, um, where the care pathways of individual physicians and health systems generally align to what um, we would do anyways to just relax those. So I think there may be more targeted, like 20% was kind of like a, a big number to start with, but there may be more targeted ways of continuing to reduce that burden. And we are really fortunate. Like we really are fortunate in Minnesota because generally speaking, we have very good health care, very low fraud, waste, and abuse, where maybe in other areas it's not as easy to do that. Well, thank you so much, and um, yeah, <laughs> let's have a round of applause for all three speakers so far. Yeah, so let's take a little break until 5.10, uh, and then we'll come back together to hear from three other fantastic speakers. Thank you.
Okay, should we start? Should we start the program? Yes, we, we have to think. Oh, God. We should, we should, that would be fun. Yeah. Carlson <laughs> Gong. Okay, let's get started. We're gonna get started. There will be lots of other opportunities to network. At least you're in the back. All right. It's corporate strategy that took it out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we have another one of our undergraduate students, Lana, making an introduction of the next speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lana Ingebrand, and I'm a second year student here at the Carlson School. I'm planning on studying human resources in the business of healthcare. I'm currently enrolled in one of, of, in one of PNAR's classes, mar Navigating the Healthcare Marketplace, and it's a great, fun time. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Tenbit Imuru. Dr. Imuru is currently the Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for UCARE. Her passion for improving healthcare outcomes for underserved populations shines in this role. She has her MD, PhD, and MBA. As a leader in this industry, she plays a vital role in driving the strategic direction of, for the entire organization. Um, with ample experience, the formal chi former chief of neurology uses her wealth of knowledge to now serve on the board of directors for the Minnesota Board of Medical Practice and creating health healthy communities. Please help me give a warm welcome to the two-time winner of the Minnesota Monthly's Top Doctor Award, Dr. Imaru. <laughs> Thank you, it's so great to be here, I'm honored. It's so great to be amongst the other speakers who um, have done a great job so far and I can't wait to hear the rest. Uh, so I'm here to talk about UCARE's approach to health equity. Um, UCARE is a nonprofit um, health insurance pair, mostly in the government business, uh, Medicare, Medicaid is the largest business and a small portion of the individual, Obamacare, essentially. Um, so, Health disparities, they are everywhere. They're reported everywhere. Access to care and disparity on access to care, quality of care, new treatments, health outcomes, affordability, social drivers of health, health health care policy. So we've seen disparities reported along all those areas. I'm just gonna uh, click through a, uh, you know, a number of recent news postings that I found just in the last couple of weeks as I was preparing for this talk. Fierce healthcare. One in five mothers treated during maternity care nearly half withhold um, concerns. They don't report any of their concerns. And most of those are women of color. Uh, so that's disparity in quality care, right? The New York Times, faulty oxygen readings delayed care to black and Hispanic COVID patients. That's disparity in medical device, studies, calibration, uh, leapfrog, racial disparities in patient safety. Black patients experience a higher incidence of surgery-related complications than white patients. And get this, 34% higher rate of sepsis. Sepsis is disseminated infection after surgery. This is disparity in outcome and quality, and really life, right? Uh, the Hartford News. Black U.S. workers face greater barriers to mental health support at work. Disparity in access. You don't even have to be in the healthcare setting. Um, Journal of American Medical Association. 
racial bias in the treatment and management of pay. Now, this has been reported for decades, right? This is nothing new. Uh, but guess what? AI may influence whether or not you can get pain medications, right? I love chat GPT. <laughs> And yes, as a physician, I know we'll all be replaced at some point. However, bias could also exist in AI, right? Uh, the New York Times. The New York City neighborhood that is getting even thinner on Ozempic, right? Uh, and let me tell you, it is not South Bronx. It's Upper East Side. So access to new treatments, access to new drugs is limited. Um, financial management, employed women's out-of-pocket health costs are 15.4 billion higher than men's. Disparity in affordability of care, right? Okay, so how about the Minnesota-specific data? We all know that Minnesota, most of you have said it, uh, has the really good infrastructure for health care. Ask anyone who goes south in the winter. They come back and they want to get their care here, right? Uh, <laughs> However, Minnesota also ranks among the lowest in health equity, right? That great infrastructure for healthcare is not the same for everyone. So Minnesota Community Measurement, which reports data on quality outcomes for Minnesota. Uh, this is the latest report for care delivered that was for care delivered in 2021. The report in 2022 showed essentially um, compared to a statewide rate on performance of quality measures, significantly lower performance rates were observed for black, indigenous, native, Hispanic, Latinx patients, patients who, ref who prefer to speak Hmong, Somali, or Spanish, and patients from Laos, Mexico, or Somalia. The largest disparity in performance compared to statewide rate was in colorectal, colorectal cancer screening for all groups except the indigenous and native patients. And among indigenous and native patients, the largest disparity occurred in optimal asthma control measure, which was 19% below the statewide rate. 19% below, that's huge. Okay, so what about UCARE specific data? So we do population assessments every year. That is basically a fancy term for studying the members that we serve. And we look at the data based on age, disability, geographic distribution, uh, racial and ethnic lines, uh, English proficient, proficiency, and all of that. Few things to highlight, Asians. So prevention and screening rates tended to be higher in racial groups in, in, than other racial groups. Now, understand that Asians, it's not a homogenous group, right? But that's the data we have is, you know, one box. So take that with a grain of salt. The risks vary by product, whether or not you're in Medicare, Medicaid, or uh, dual eligible, uh, and English proficiency. So higher prevalence rate for most medical conditions in this group, higher cost, utilization, less likely to get childhood well visits, asthma, mammograms, dental care. Uh, blacks. Again, this is not a homogenous group. Cardiovascular risk is high in the English proficient group, but post-traumatic stress disorder and low back pain in the limited English group. High disease burden, cost, and utilization, except for those who are young in age, which makes sense. Less likely to get childhood well visits, mammograms, uh, dental care. And mammograms, mammogram rates significantly lower in members who, are, uh, who have limited English. Right? And pregnancies in black members are more frequently identified as high risk. Native Americans do worse than any other racial group across all products. High disease burden, cost, utilization, high concentration of members with severe pers persistent mental illness, dominant medical and psychiatric conditions, tobacco and other substance use. Prevention and screening rates are low. Pregnancies are more frequently identified as complicated often by substance use and mental health disorders. Okay, so what do we do as a society, as a state, as healthcare organizations, as a provider like me, right? What do we do? Uh, addressing health equity actually is a long-term commitment that we have to make. It's not done by one organization. It's not done by only healthcare organization. It starts by addressing an individual's needs and preferences, 
in how they want to consume healthcare, all the way to making a long-term commitment to change policies, procedures, and structure that, has, that have contributed to health inequities for decades, right? Um, you need a framework in what, although UCARE has been doing this for many years, we recently got um, an accreditation, which is a special one from National Committee on Quality Assurance, and they specifically have a health equity accreditation, which basically provides you a framework that is actionable for improving health equity and prioritizing initiatives. It's a nationally recognized accreditation that distinguishes organizations who do this very well. So we're proud of that. But what is UCARE's specific approach? So the core tenets of UCARE's approach to health equity are accurate, timely, and actionable data, strong partnership with providers, community organizations, local, state, and federal governmental organizations, and then commitment to co-creation of solutions to those with those who've been burdened by the long-standing structure of our healthcare system. And I'm just gonna quickly give you an example from each. Data is really important. You can't do much without data. Um, so we collect data from an analytics company uh, that, will, that will focus on social drivers of health, both on an individual level as well as a household level, uh, all the way to you know, zip codes and grocery stores and, you know, um, median household income, all of that. Uh, we have a robust population health program that includes the members' medical risk as well as their ability to manage their own medical conditions. Claims data is a no-brainer, right? We're payers. Uh, and then we have health equity community engagement work where we actually collect data from the community, we hold focus groups, we learn um, from our community-based organization uh, partners. Uh, we have uh, data that identifies high-risk members and their gaps in care. Um, uh, we have health risk assessments that are sent to every member. Uh, we, so we collect a variety of data and we utilize a predictive analytics tool to incorporate what we learn into our action lists. Um, strong partnerships. We part, our partners range from medical and mental health providers, pharmacies, especially community pharmacies. Uh, community organizations, uh, community health workers, federally qualified um, healthcare centers, critical access dental practices. And we have a variety of partnerships. We provide grants, we provide enhanced payments for uh, closure of gaps and clinical care gaps, uh, particularly to those who are underserved. Uh, we provide, you know, these are just examples, culturally based diabetes prevention program for black and indigenous women, improving health outcomes for Latinx Minnesotans living in rural communities through stable housing. I may provide you with a prescription for Ozempic or whatever else, but if you don't have a home to live in, it will be pretty difficult for you to control your diabetes. We can't just treat the disease, we have to address the entire human condition, right? Uh, expanding and evaluating integrated holistic health services for American Indian birthing people to increase access to culturally responsive perinatal health services in Northwestern Minnesota, where there isn't really a big health system, right? Expanding culturally responsive children's dental services and oral health education to 1,500 tribal and Asian community members. This is what we did this year. And then for providers, online learning resource center that provides training on how to provide culturally uh, responsive care. The third is commitment to co-creation of solutions. We are not approaching it from a perspective of, we know best for you, uh, and therefore, this is what you should do as a community or as a population, right? We don't do that. We increase community engagement efforts to understand community needs and barriers. I think someone said the communities know what they need. We, our role is to really listen. And then co-design targeted interventions. Implement and continuously evaluate interventions to maximize impact and effectiveness. And then we work with local community partners and gather member feedback to make sure that we're addressing the gaps in care that we're seeing from a culturally responsive perspective. Health equity in action at UCARE looks like this. 
respond to diverse cultural health beliefs. We have uh, the largest Medicaid business in the state, and we have a very diverse uh, group of members. Uh, organizational policies, practices that promote culturally and linguistically appropriate services. Our governance, leadership, and workforce that is diverse. Offering language assistance at no cost. Ensuring the competence of those who provide language assistance. Provide easy to understand print and multimedia member material. Strengthening data collection. Like I said, without data that is actionable, you can't really do much. So we want to collect uh, racial, ethnic, uh, language, um, sexual orientation, gender identity data, wherever we can. Uh, use a data-driven and evidence-based approach. Uh, partner with federal, state, and local governments to advance policy change, because ultimately, we have to address some things at the policy level, change legislations, and healthcare reform that, re that reduce disparities. And that integrate health equity into a day-to-day -day work throughout the organization. Health equity at UCARE is not something that sits in a different department that's over there. Um, it, it is integrated into every single thing that we do. And finally, I will leave you with this, and I, I want to make sure I do justice in quoting uh, the author of this paper, The Curb Cut Effect by Angela Glover Lockwell. So the story is, one evening in the 1970s, early 1970s, disability advocates poured cement onto the sidewalk to um, make a ramp so that those on wheelchairs could get onto the sidewalk and off the, off the sidewalk really easy, because that was not done before. Uh, and then these advocates um, then continued to protest. And finally, this was in Berkeley, California. Uh, in 1972, the city officially installed their first uh, curb cut on a street that's popular. Uh, and then in 1990, the American Disabilities Act was signed, uh, which prohibited disability-based uh, discrimination. And George H.W. Bush at the time said, let the shameful wall of exclusion come tumbling down. When the wall of exclusion came down, this is what happened. Everybody benefited, not only the people in wheelchairs, but parents who were pushing strollers, folks who were traveling with big luggage, uh, skaters, right, <laughs> uh, runners, and even these guys, the far um, right-hand side of the picture, segways, right? I mean, they zip in and out of um, sidewalks. Everyone benefits. When we change, and the author said, when we change something for the most vulnerable, everybody benefits. That is called a curb cut effect. And I leave you with this, when we commit to improving the health uh, of the most vulnerable in each of our communities. Uh, we improve health for everyone. Thank you. Thank you for leaving us with that very powerful command. Questions? I'm sorry. Hi, thanks. My name is Peter Musimami. So thank you for the health equity work you do at UCARE. Um, you mentioned that UCARE has the largest Medicaid population. Now with uh, redetermination and likely disenrollment, um, there's going to be folks who drop off of that. Mm -hmm. Now for your limited English proficient populations, mm -hmm. uh, so this is a two-part question. Mm -hmm. How are you ensuring that they kind of don't slip through the cracks. And what, what do you identify as some of your risks, your internal costs, your challenges, really to um, engaging with these populations? Because I feel that they, they will be significantly impacted, not only by this, but other disparities. Absolutely. That is such a, a great question, a timely question, an important question right now. Uh, as you know, CMS just halted disenrollment for technical reasons, right? Because someone does, did not fill out a form. Uh, this has been on our mind since before the, the, the PHE um, ended. Uh, what we're doing is working very closely with the state uh, on how to approach members, updating addresses, 
and actually the best place for a member to find out whether or not they need to re-enroll uh, is at their primary care or at their doctor's office. So what we did is because this is an undue burden on providers to make sure that their patients actually fill out the form, are aware that this is gonna happen, it, we wanted to compensate a provider. So we gave your end funding so that providers can actually tackle this at every single clinic that we can imagine. Uh, we're also uh, engaging a couple of uh, external vendors so that they can actually reach out to members, uh, particularly those who um, have limited understanding of how the system works. Um, so we're doing that with those, with two. And then our own, we have a team, we've had it since before COVID, but definitely now we've revamped that team. It's called Keep Your Coverage Team. We want everyone to keep their coverage, so we have an internal team. So it's internal, external partnership, and then a partnership with our providers. This is gonna be, um, this is gonna change healthcare for the worse until we get to a steady state because there will be uh, members who will um, disenroll and who continue to be eligible, but they just don't know. And whatever, to those who are no longer eligible, we're also providing uh, resources where they can find, where they can find uh, coverage in, on the exchange, um, which is um, what the state's recommendation is, right? That's the next thing, or Minnesota Care. So that's a really good question, thank you. Thank you, my uh, desk mate here convinced me I should give him the, the next question. <laughs> Actually, it's a comment and a question. First of all, I want to commend you on your efforts. My mom was the beneficiary of the UCARE program, and she received excellent care, number one. Number two, I think the language piece is, kind of, it was brought up. I think at every appointment that my mom was, there was a translator, either physically or through like a app, like a, um, on a Mac or kind of on an iPad, actually. So again, I, I, th I think I really... But the one thing was that it did require me to be at most of the appointments for things to work smoothly. And so I wonder, like, how often do you involve caregivers in your data gathering process to make things better? Because mm -hmm. I can assure you that some of the procedures that she went through, like a pain pump installation, you know, I acquired a company for Medtronic, and I knew that it's a very good infection control product and people who are in a high kind of immunocompromised status will get infections if not, if the procedure is not done with that product. So I had to talk to the physician to make sure that that product gets used. My mom kind of did not have an infection, thank God. She was already going through cancer therapy, but it's a very active involvement by a caregiver. And I feel like that, at least I didn't get asked as to what would you do to kind of improve, but mm -hmm. patients get sent things with their names and sometimes I look at it, but. I feel like that may be helpful, and I'm wondering at your comment. Yeah. Um, can, can we give a round of applause to caregivers? We have so many. We are all caregivers here. <laughs> and, and I think they're really, like, they're, they're a big piece of our healthcare system, and we need to think more about them overall throughout. Yeah. So I love the fact that she likes you, Care. We try to do good work. <laughs> Uh, so how do you involve caregivers? Uh, for us, whether it's the care management team or the quality team who reaches out to members and say, hey, you're due for a colonoscopy or a mammogram or your children need immunizations, this and that, uh, it's to the extent that the member allows us to, re to include family members, right? Uh, first and foremost, we're all healthcare professionals and we do respect HIPAA and it is the law. However, if a member wants um, somebody else, particularly if there is a language barrier, we use an interpreter, but then if they also want to have a family member, that is always the case um, that we, we have no, I mean, if the member wants it, the member wants it. Uh, but also if there is a cultural barrier, right? Um, what we do is we have a team of uh, community health workers who are who come from a very diverse group of people, group of uh, communities. So, for example, we have a few Somali 
community health work, healthcare workers. And when we try to reach out to members and say, hey, you're, you're due for a mammogram, uh, you're due for a colonoscopy, they actually reach out to those members who they share cultural backgrounds with so that they could explain. It, it, it's not something that you just do with an interpreter because an interpreter just literally interprets, but the cultural background is missing, right? Uh, so we try to include folks who come from uh, similar backgrounds to do some of this work. And they then at the time can ask, you know, oh, I live with my son. All right, well, do you want to include your son in this conversation? So I have actually driven around uh, with our care managers when they go and visit members in their homes, and they ask, so who do you want to be there when I come? Do you want anybody? Do you think your, your son would come, or do you think your daughter would come? Because yes, a lot of us are caregivers, especially to the elderly, so. Thank you. We, we are running out of time, but we have a committed question, so I'm going to make sure that happens. <laughs> Thank you. When you were talking about Ozempic, I was thinking about how, especially throughout COVID, uh, there was a big explosion of digital health tools, but there's the risk that some of those digital health tools are only accessible to you know certain individuals of means based on their, their economic status. So I'm curious. Um, with health equity in mind and the Medicaid population in mind, how have benefits changed or other services um, changed at UCARE to allow for um, equal or equitable access to, whether it's telehealth services, remote patient monitoring, or other um, valuable uh, digital health interventions that, that you've embraced? Yeah, and so, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'll give you two, two answers to that question. Um, when COVID uh, first started, I was um, at Hennepin Healthcare. I, you know, half my job was actually seeing patients in the ICU. Uh, we were literally handing out iPads because that's what you had to do, right? To connect patients to their family because no one could visit them. And some, and as the, um, uh, as COVID sort of unwinded, uh, people who wanted to get care via telemedicine, but couldn't because they didn't have a device or they didn't know how to use it. Most of the time, it's that they didn't know how to use it. We were actually showing people how to do it, right? So the, the virtual medical assistant would connect with them first and say, this is what you do when, when the doc or when the provider goes in. So that was, that was at the beginning. But right now, it's actually, um, I, I, for me, everything starts with education, right? First, do they want that option? And you know, you'll be surprised, it's not always the case for everyone, right? And then the second is, the device issue is not really an issue anymore because most people have cell phones, right? Uh, the high uh, speed broadband is an issue. And so we partner with community organizations, for example, can they go to a community center? Can they go to a adult day center? Um, and we do a lot of work with adult day centers and community organizations. With, so one is to, for connectivity, and two is uh, right now for unwinding, for, for PHE unwinding, for example, we have people who would go there and say, hey, this is what you have to do um, to fill out the paperwork for the state, but also, uh, we used to have pharmacists uh, who are actually in the high-rise buildings in their community rooms actually doing medication therapy management. Make sure that you know people bring a bag full of medications and say, okay, which ones do you take? And we've often found people taking uh, multiple medications of the same class. And we did that do, using a phone sometimes, but also in person. And you have to choose a hybrid approach because not, not everyone is choosing that option, although many are. So the device itself is quite, it's not really the issue at this point for most people. Thank you, Dr. Amor. Thank you so much. Yep, you're welcome. Now we have Le Leilani introducing the next speaker. 
Hi, my name is Leilani Starnes. I'm a current undergrad um, senior here at the Carlson School of Management, um, studying a major in marketing with a minor in business healthcare. Today, I'm introducing uh, Jenny Ramseth. She is the chief of She's the Chief Product Officer of Best Buy Health, leading the product management, uh, research, design, and marketing teams. She received her bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering at the University of Wisconsin, and she got her MBA here at the Carlson School of Management and Business Administration. She has over 15 years of health uh, technology experience, leading product strategy and innovation teams, and she is passionate about creating solutions that make a meaningful difference in people's lives. A warm welcome to Jenny. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. Really pleased to be here, proud to be part of just this incredible panel. I wish I could just be sitting listening to everyone else speak. Um, I've learned so much. So let's talk about Best Buy Health. So oftentimes I get the question, like, say I'm from Best Buy Health and people look at me like I have a couple heads. Like, Best Buy Health, that Best Buy? So I hope uh, through the next 15 minutes that we can talk a little bit about why Best Buy is in health. Yes, it is that Best Buy. Um, what we're doing, what we're not doing, what impact we're seeing, and how we might partner together to do more. So I wanted to start with our Best Buy purpose. Our purpose is to enrich lives through technology. Um, I will admit, before I was a Best Buy employee, um, I have been a longtime Best Buy customer super fan. Um, so I am a little bit biased. Also want all of you to come work at Best Buy too, so we'll, we'll see if I can beat out Andrew. Um, and, and when I think about my experiences as a customer at Best Buy, I think about how excited I am to get my hands on the latest technology. I think about how helpful the store employees have been to really helping me understand what is gonna work best for my needs, what problems do I have to solve, who am I shopping for, what's the difference bet between these things. I think about how glad I am to have Geek Squad to help me get it set up, make sure it's working, help me when it stops working because it always stops working. Does anyone have a printer that you set it up and then for so every time you go to print, it's like, sorry, not on the network. It's like, that's, that's your job. Geek Sweat's there, they fix it every time. Um, and most importantly, I always, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, so I feel like I should know technology really well. I love how approachable Best Buy makes the technology, how humanizing it really is. And those are really the things that have driven us to, to be in health. So when we look at, and we uh, have all talked about sort of these, these big trends, technology is moving more and more into health. Um, what were some of the stats we, we learned earlier? 1,700% increase in telehealth use through the pandemic. 88% of people still want to use virtual care. Um, technology is just becoming more and more important. Um, explosion of different devices, more consumer facing, just reliance on that, that data, AI. Um, technology is really here to make a difference. And we're seeing health move more and more into the home. Um, over 100 billion in Medicare dollars go to home care. People often want to stay in their home. We talked about going to the doctor is, is a total pain in the butt. Um, the more we can really deliver that care at home, that's better. And that's really where, where Best Buy's sweet spot is. So with these trends too, we see major obstacles and barriers. The home is not always optimized for health. People might ha not have high-speed broadband to make all this technology work. They might not have uh, the right technology. Less than 3% of homes are accessible. So if we want care to go in the home, we need to think about creating an environment in the home to make that work. Um, and people aren't always supported to engage in their health. Um, understanding how to use all of the technology, having somebody there to, to support when something goes wrong, really helping through that that entire journey. Um, technology alone cannot solve all of our problems. AI is not gonna solve all of our problems, but all of this can help with the right human support. So Best Buy, we are focused on enabling care at home for everyone. We chose those words really intentionally. So one, we enable care. Uh, what we don't do is deliver care. You will not see 
a Best Buy clinic. You will not see a Best Buy pharmacy. We are really here to support providers providing care, people getting the technology they need, making it work. And we enable care for everyone. It is through in a, in a health equity focus, accessibility, designing solutions for those who need it most that helps everyone. We do this across the care continuum, so thinking about from staying well through getting well, wellness at home, aging, care at home, and all really built on the things that Best Buy does better than anyone. Omnichannel capabilities, logistics support, in-home services, tech support, those are really the aspects that we're focused on. So I'll go a little bit into each of these three areas. So wellness at home, this is what you probably think of most. This is really access to the best health products, technology that people can buy in our stores online every day. Everything from uh, health trackers, does anyone have this cool smart ring? Um, probably wondering why my heart is racing so fast right now, checking, tracking everything I do, to uh, blood pressure cuffs and smart thermometers to hearing aids. And most recently we announced a partnership with Dexcom uh, wheel and health dine to offer prescription-based continuous glucose monitors. So this is all about breaking down barriers for people to get the products they need to take care of their own health. Aging at home, we have a uh, line of our lively products and services. This focuses on easy to use devices, phones, medical alerts that provide with the touch of a button access to personalized services, a human at the end of the line um, that can provide anything from emergency services, so anything that's an emergency for our one million members that could be, I need a locksmith, I need roadside assistance, I'm lonely, I'm scared, I'm lost, I've fallen, I need medical support. Um, so any, any type of those emergencies, we have social care support. So really personalized support to understand needs across the social determinants of health and really connect uh, people to resources in their community to solve those needs. Uh, we have a nurse line, we have transportation services, tech support. Often it's just somebody to talk to at the end of the line um, to ask anything. Um, all of these services are delivered by over a thousand highly empathetic, compassionate, specially trained individuals that connect with, with our, our members over seven million times a year. And last, uh, Care at Home. So here we offer our current health uh, Care at Home platform, remote patient monitoring, uh, curated devices that connect into that platform, EHR connectivity, clinical dashboards, and alerting uh, to support health systems who are providing Care at Home programs across hospital at home, post-acute care, transitional care, and chronic care management. And again, all of this really driven from the things that Best Buy does best. Super obsessed with the consumer experience. So how do we really think about what we do to make it easy to choose the best TV and bring that same thinking to healthcare? That's really complicated and not easy. Um, how do we use Geek Squad for in-home support, tech support, um, logistics, you know, over 70% of the population lives within 10 miles of a Best Buy. How do we use that infrastructure to really make it easier to get um, and support logistics? Um, curated devices that connect into uh, healthcare providers, an in-home consultation and support to really help people as their health needs evolve. I wanted to talk a little bit more about Geek Squad because um, we've been seeing some really exciting results. So we've partnered with Geisinger uh, for about a year really co-creating what does Geek Squad look like for a health use case. Um, so we've been uh, working through a chronic care at home management program. So before uh, Geek Squad, what would happen, the patient is enrolled in the, the care at home program, they're then shipped their devices, a kit with blood pressure cuffs, barometer, uh, tablet, connectivity hub, and they have to set that kit up with the help of their family or a phone call. Um, instead, with Geek Squad, once they're enrolled, Geek Squad will show up with all the equipment they need, we'll get it set up for them, we'll provide education for them and their family. The caregivers play such an important role in care at home. Um, 
and we'll get everything up and running and be there for ongoing support. And we've seen some just really encouraging results. 50% reduction in the time from admission to, vi to vice setup. So people are getting set up running faster. A big improvement in how well patients then are able to use that equipment and follow their care plans, a reduction in technical issues, and a really a world-class net promoter score of 89. So really, really encouraging to see how we can take you know, something uh, we, we do every day and really apply it, tailor it to a healthcare conference, uh, context to get different results. And last, I want to leave you with um, one of our biggest lessons is that we, we need to partner in different ways. We have all talked about the massive and growing challenges in healthcare, and nobody, no organization can solve this on their own. So we have partnered with different technology companies, healthcare systems, payers, you name it, to really bring different expertise, different capabilities, different thinking to solve these problems in new ways. So this is really call to action that we need to break down barriers, we need to come together to solve these problems together. Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, just following up on the focus on user experience, wondering if you could talk a little bit about the ways that you integrate um, the user experience into development of new products. I'm thinking particularly in the aging sector and engaging seniors. Yeah, I mean, I think, and we've, we other panelists talk about co-creation is just so essential. So making sure we're really designing with, not for, the people we serve, and that's, that's everyone. So really, you know, when we talk about seniors are 65 plus, that is such a diverse group of people. So it's not, you know, we really avoid stereotyping and making assumptions and really work to understand unique, unique needs across that entire uh, segment. Um, so you talked about, uh, you know, all these new technologies that are coming out, like your ring, I'm sure Apple watches, blood pressure devices, all these things. How are you, um, or how is Best Buy kind of limiting um, how these new technologies are um, increasing health disparities? Because I have to imagine the new technologies are more expensive, um, and those people who are from lower socioeconomic statuses, kind of how are you giving, getting them accesses? Do you have any programs kind of set up to help those access? Yeah, points? that's a really great question. So we have, you know, across those different areas, we have our, you know, direct-to-consumer business. We also work to provide um, our solutions through health plans and health systems. So it's really about making sure we're, we're curating technology that's accessible across the board. Some people are going to want to pay for their Apple Watch, not everything needs an Apple Watch. So how do we make sure there's, there's a good alternative and we're not leaving people out because they can't access those technologies? One more. Let's take one more and then we can. Um, I was curious how your business has changed both pre-pandemic and then post-pandemic. Well, so, so Best Buy has, we've been in health for about five years. So we're mostly sort of in and then after pandemic and what we I mean what we saw is just the the increase of technology into health and health into the home through through the pandemic so that's really what has driven us to accelerate and see in, with that acceleration we've seen all of the the gaps and really the the logistics and the plumbing required to make all of that work Now we have Kezia, one of our undergraduate students again, to introduce our last speaker. Hi everyone, my name is Kezia Kim. I'm a third year here at Carlson. I'm studying uh, management information systems. 
I'm recovering a little bit from a cold, so please excuse me if I cough during this, but it is an absolute honor to introduce our final speaker, Megan Remark. With over 30 years of experience in healthcare, Megan serves as the Senior Vice President at Health Partners and as the President of Regents Hospital, as well as Regents Hospital Foundation. She is a driving force behind making healthcare more accessible and affordable, focusing on safety and high reliability in hospitals and promoting diversity and inclusion in the healthcare industry. Megan's commitment extends not only in the healthcare industry, but in the communities, as she is involved in areas such as education, affordable housing, and fostering trust within all communities. Megan's contributions have not gone unnoticed, as she's been a recipient of Minneapolis St. Paul's Business Journal's 40 Under 40 Award, and is consistently recognized as one of Minnesota's top leaders. It is an absolute honor to be having her today, and please give, me a, war give a warm welcome to Megan Remark. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what a pleasure it is to be here today. What a great afternoon. You know, it seems like we should figure out how to do this more often because it's just been a, a great opportunity for um, all of you and I think all of our panelists to get a snapshot into some amazing organizations doing great work. So what I thought I would do today to kind of bring us home with our formal presentations is um, share a little bit about who Health Partners is. Um, talk about a few of the key themes that have been mentioned um, along the way, and go a little bit deeper in how Health Partners is working with community partners. So you're gonna hear a little bit about um, the amazing partners that we're working with that are doing great work in the community um, beyond what we do within our hospitals and clinics and our health plan. So um, I just wanna start out by sharing Health Partners' mission, vision, and values. So our uh, 27,000 employees are really committed to this mission to improve health and well-being in partnership with our members and our patients and our communities. And you've heard a lot today about the fantastic care and service that is provided to so many of our citizens in the state of Minnesota. Um, but what we recognize at Health Partners, and I think you've heard from others today, is that health goes far beyond what we do in hospitals and clinics and in health plans. And so that's why at Health Partners we have a vision really focused on health beyond healthcare. Health as it could be, affordability as it must be, through relationships built on trust. And we're gonna talk a little bit today in our conversation about Health Partners that trust is really a key as we're working with an increasingly diverse community. And as we recognize the fact that even the United States with all of our resources have some of the worst health disparities in the world and the lowest life expectancy of other high income nations. And that's something that needs to change. There is absolutely no excuse for who we are as a country to have that failing statistic. And so at Health Partners, we recognize what we do well and where we need partners. And I wanna share a little bit more with you about that today. So here's a bit of our partner for good work as a health plan, a care system. We do a lot of research and education, which people may not um, really understand. And we have um, nine foundations across our organization that partner with um, citizens interested in being a partner for good and getting out in the community and making a difference. And so I wanna share a little bit with you today about that. Um, we talked, um, well, actually, here's one more commercial about health partners. I'll throw that in. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we're really proud of what we do. Um, we, we take a lot of time really focused on patient-centered care and member-centered care and making care more simple and affordable. That has been a key thread through every single one of our conversations today. We all know that healthcare is too hard and it's too complicated. And I just wanna share a brief story in my personal life. Um, I'm the youngest of three and the only girl in the family. And when my parents were aging, and, and both of my parents have, have uh, passed away, but when my parents were aging and my father was ill with liver disease, I told my mom to take a notebook into the doctor's office because I'm living in Minnesota and they live in Las Vegas, Nevada. And um, my mom kept coming out of these conversations with doctors, and actually back then, different than now, we're much better at this today, we have a lot more family involvement in the exam room even if a daughter is far away. We can get in through either iPads or even on the phone just to connect. But at the time, I was always waiting at the phone, you know, with the cord, <laughs> um, to find out what happened at that exam. And my mother would leave there, and she was the healthy one at the time, and she said, I have no idea what just happened. 
And so when we talk about using plain language, everyone is, is impacted by the fact that healthcare is too complicated and that we need to care more about how people are receiving the information, not just how we're giving that information out. And so while we're so proud of all of these top awards at Health Partners, we know we can all do better um, to make sure that we're providing that patient and family-centered care and making it easier to um, navigate the healthcare system. So a few of our presenters today talked a little bit about the social determinants of health. And I, I just want to call out that this is a mantra that we live by, not just in care delivery, but also in all of our research and education and the work in our health plan, is that good health is not just the absence of disease. And what we, I think one of our speakers, Michelle, had mentioned, it's life before diagnosis. There's a lot that goes on before diagnosis. And, um, and a couple of things I just want to call out, one is, that when we talk about the socioeconomic factors, it's things like education, with your high school degree being one of the biggest determinants of life expectancy. It's your zip code, another big determinant of life expectancy. And we, there has been study after study after study that talks about the fact that in areas like in St. Paul, within a five mile radius of Regions Hospital, there can be a 10 year discrepancy in life expectancy due to these social determinants of health. Um, behavioral issues like diet, exercise, tobacco, um, and um, alcohol use. And 10% is, is actually it's surprising to me that this is only 10% because I think this is increasingly becoming an issue in the United States. It has to do with the quality of our environment and how it's built. So thinking about things like access to healthy food, neighborhood parks and green spaces, clean water, clean air, that many people who live in areas that don't have this can't control it and we're born in that environment. And so how do we overcome all of that in our 20% that's left in the time people spend in hospitals and clinics? We have to get out where our populations are living and working and really pay attention to what they need and how we can make it easier for them to get the health care um, that they need overall. So our, our approach to community partnerships um, beyond the care and coverage we provide to our patients, we have identified several key areas here. I'm not going to read all of these to you just in the interest of time, of where we're focusing our attention of getting out in the community with community partners who are experts in what they do and combining our expertise in order to make a difference. So, um, for example, just a few things I want to highlight that I'm really proud of of the work that we're doing at Health Partners. One is um, we launched the Make It Okay campaign probably oh, 15 years ago or so. The Make It Okay campaign is really all about reducing the stigma of avoiding mental health care help, making it just as easy to talk about health, um, mental health as it is to talk about having cancer or diabetes, and really doing that through reducing stigma, through providing um, provider toolkits to help their employees feel comfortable speaking up for mental health, because on average, someone waits 10 years before they're willing to actually get help because they're worried about it impacting their job security, what people think about them, and how they function in the world. So we're really proud about that work. Um, working to end the opioid epidemic. We have had an initiative with all of our clinicians and have reduced our opioid prescribing by over 50% in the last five years. Major initiative to get drugs off the street and to make sure that they're used responsibly and reducing not just how often we prescribe the drug, but what the strength is of that drug we prescribe. And I know that we're not perfect at it. When my son had his, um, his uh, wisdom teeth pulled, we said no, we didn't want a narcotic afterwards, and it was automatic, already went through to the pharmacy, and I show up at the pharmacy with that prescription. So we know that we can do better, and people are being more articulate about their needs and their wishes, and that makes a big difference, speaking up for what you, what you really want as an individual. Um, I also want to talk about addressing the health equity emergency. Um, a plug here for um, a Health Partners podcast called Off the Charts. Off the Charts is actually co-hosted by two physicians that work at Health Partners that talk about their work to reduce the disparities gaps. And they interview other Health Partners colleagues in season one. But in season two and three, we get out in the community and share the stories of what others are doing to make a difference, to really highlight examples of what's possible and to actually create and crowdsource ideas to really make a difference. Our Off the Charts podcast is on any of your streaming um, apps, I get it mine on Spotify. It's, I feel like Spot, I'm, I always do a commercial for Spotify. I feel like it's the place I get all my news and information today. 
Um, but our Off the Charts podcast has really um, given voice um, to many people that are doing creative things in small pockets. And one of the things that I learned from our board, from one of our board members when I was talking about scale, is they said, you know, most complex, really complex issues are really hard to take to scale, and you have to be able to have that incubator to be able to look at how you address those complex things. And small batch ideas shared with others can spread over time because everyone has a unique approach to how they may want to individualize what their communities need. So um, we have been involved in an equity action lab, and, um, and you've heard actually some conversations about our growing Somali community and really trying to get out in community to listen and learn and understand what people's needs and perceptions are and what our communities think good health is. And that varies greatly. Um, and how open people are willing to talk about mental health, for an example, is very different across all of the cultures um, that we see here in the Twin Cities. And so um, we are actively involved in an equity action lab that actually is a national initiative. It's been um, sponsored by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI. And um, we have actually crowdsourced about 20 um, formal and informal leaders from the Somali community to help us listen and learn and understand and reduce the disparities in preventive services in this population. When you think about breast cancer screening, colorectal screening, um, getting in early for diabetes and asthma, understanding the signs and symptoms of stroke, and that, and that many cultures don't want to run to an ER. They want to run away from an ER. And so how do we help people actually get better health when they do need health care? Um, and doing it by understanding and meeting people where they're at. So um, that just got started, and, uh, and we're looking forward to hearing more um, uh, and, and to actually changing our approaches to what we're doing. So um, looking forward to happy hour uh, and, uh, and talking a little bit more about a variety of different topics. Um, but I want to just focus in on, um, on a collaboration and a partnership regarding food um, instability. So um, this is a, a picture, a few pictures of our Super Shelf, and I'm really excited to share this with you. Um, Super Shelf is a statewide cross-sector collaboration that's transforming food shelves to create welcoming environments for individuals to access appealing, healthy foods. And this started at um, one of our health partners facilities, our Stillwater Lakeview Hospital um, in Stillwater, Minnesota in 2013. Now, we have actually a very generous state. I believe there's over 800 food shelves across the state of Minnesota in both urban and rural environments. Um, but this collaboration actually did a survey of people who frequent um, food shelves to say what's working and what's not. And so this is an innovation where it says let's reinvent and figure out both with private and public money how we actually can bring better food beyond what we would consider box or canned foods. And so I'm um, really proud of this initiative. Um, Health Partners, we are still involved in this um, through an advisory capacity, through research and education, um, and also on the leadership committee. So um, a couple of things about this work. So the Super Shelf brings fresh fruits, vegetables, meats, grains, along with healthy and culturally connected foods individualized to the local community, and really increases access to food beyond those prepackaged um, uh, cans and boxes. And um, frequent users of the food shelf indicate that the super shelf format creates more options that they'd not normally buy or have access to due to cost, and it helps people save money that they can put towards other expenses like rent and utilities. Um, one of the things I would just want to recognize is that we have converted through this collaboration, and this was actually helped through a grant um, from um, the National Institute of Health through the University of Minnesota, so again, partnership in action. Hard to do this kind of work alone. We've converted 50 of the, um, shelf, of the food shelves in the state of Minnesota to super shelves, and there's another 20 on the way. So everybody has access to be able to look at what does it take to meet this criteria to provide better food closer to where patients need it. Um, in addition to our work with, our, with the Super Shelf, we have also been partnering with Keystone Community Services um, with our teams at Health Partners, our employees, volunteering at farmers markets. And actually, one of the things that has been really great is that we have been helping financially to support um, as a contributor to the Keystone food mobiles. 
and we are bringing food mobiles to our inner city clinics. We started in St. Paul and um, this year alone at three clinics and with addition of the food of the, of the markets that we've supported, over 700 families in St. Paul just in this year alone. And what has been great about this is that we have a diverse community that comes to our clinics and they trust our physicians and clinicians and actually we roll those food mobiles right into our parking lots that are also near um, subsidized housing and, um, and really bring the community in and have our caregivers actually be a part of helping people get access to that food. So it's that trust that people have that this is a safe environment, this is a safe place for me to get food is just a way um, to improve access. And then also within our hospitals, and I think all of our hospitals have access to EPIC, and I think many hospitals are doing a, what I'm about to describe, but it's really doing a social determinants of health assessment when someone comes into an inpatient setting. So the 80% that happens outside of our hospitals and clinics, we recognize that when someone comes into a hospital, they may spend two to five days with us um, if they don't need a transitional care unit. <laughs> right now, um, they stay a lot longer. But day one, we actually do an assessment of the social determinants of health. And related to food security, we are identifying day one if that individual is A, um, has stable housing, and B, has access to food. And if they don't, if there's no to either one of those questions, we begin working day one so that upon discharge, we are actually helping get that individual and their family connected to the sources of food that they need and or helping them with stable housing. And as you know, in Minnesota, that's particularly important as we spend most of our time in cold weather climates. So um, we're just really proud of that work and the social determinants of health concept has also been terrific for our caregivers because they see that they're helping the person not just in the moment, but longitudinally. No one wants to discharge someone with unstable housing out to the street, we don't do it. And so it's a way for our, our really our, our care teams to understand that they're making a difference longitudinally in the lives of, of the patients that we take care of. So then I want to talk a little bit more about um, healthcare equity and our approach at Health Partners. What you see here is um, a revised and deeper commitment to health equity that we actually formulated during COVID and following the murder of George Floyd. Health Partners has been a leader in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and in fact, we were one of the first organizations nationally over 20 years ago to collect race and language preferences as well as veteran status on all of our patients and members. And we are at 95% collection rate in our hospital and clinics. And I have to tell you that when this started, what today may seem like really common sense, and oh gee, why weren't we doing this before? 20 years ago, it was actually really challenging for us to talk with our colleagues, with our employees about asking these questions at front desks. Because as you can imagine, someone who has English as a second language might feel like then, well, why are you asking, you know, are you profiling me for things I'm not interested in being involved in, whether that's research or other, um, or other uses. And what we realized in, in, in that conversation is again, building trust. And over time, it has just become a natural part of the business because what we're able to do is use that information for good to understand what disparities exist in healthcare um, based on race, language, ethnicity, age, veteran status, et cetera. And so what I wanna share with you today is um, our four cornerstones. Um, we've talked a little bit about partnering with the community and advocating for change and making a difference. Um, we also are the largest private employer in St. Paul, and we decided that as, as that anchor institution with over 10,000 employees up, across both our care and our, um, our insurance plan, that really being a leader in improving the health of the St. Paul community was really important to us. So we have what's called a St. Paul anchor strategy that really is all about increasing trust with our um, patients and the community um, increasing employment opportunities. We're actually Regions Hospital this year. 50% of our new hires were um, new hires of color. Really proud of that and we're actually beating from a diversity perspective the, the statistics on the types of employees that we have and how that matches the patient population that we're taking care of. And I wanna just mention one deeper component of this. While it would be really great for me to stand here and say, gee, let's pat ourselves on the back. We're at 50% diversity of new hires and about 40% of total colleagues. 
one of the things that we recognized was we started looking unit by unit at what was the demographics of our patient population and what were the demographics of our employee population. And what we found was that we had very little diversity in our emergency department and in our OB unit, which are two of the most diverse units in our hospital from a patient perspective. We have changed that in the last five years. And so getting specific and again, getting local really matters because these broad statistics can be hit in averages where you feel better, but you still have gaps of places that you need to work. And, and I will tell you that what was so amazing is the difference when um, we actually had board members of color talk with our um, employees in the ER and talk with our employees in OB. And that representation of seeing someone who looks like you immediately half-lives, if not nine out of 10, reduces that stress of what's already a stressful situation when you come into a hospital or clinic that feels really institutionalized and feels like nothing like you've ever experienced. So our employees take seriously that for us walking through a hospital is maybe like walking through Target and it is absolutely not that experience for anyone who's coming into the hospital for a first time. So um, uh, I also wanna just mention, you know, increase, I've talked about increasing diversity and inclusion of our workplace and advancing health equity in care and coverage. And so um, that has led us to really identifying what are the goals that we want to achieve both midterm and long-term from an equity perspective. So we've made a commitment to increase the racial diversity of our leadership team by 100%. I will be transparent, when we wrote this, we were at 10%, we're now at 16. Our goal by 2025 is to have 20% of our leadership be represented by um, diversity. Um, to build an anti-racist culture, to deepen our collective understanding of cultural humility, this is a forever journey. And we do a lot in this space, everything from providing education and ongoing conversations around the role bias plays in healthcare, that no, treating everybody the same is absolutely not the right approach. We need to customize the care for the individual. Um, we just opened um, a renewed and expanded and AI capable sim center, simulation center, where we're not just actually teaching students, but we're also teaching our colleagues and the EMS community, um, not just on the clinical side of things, but what does implicit and explicit bias look like and how do we practice, for example, asking about, someone had mentioned before, toxicology screening for OB. It's something that, that providers need to ask everyone, but if you are a minority, you do feel like you're being profiled and discriminated against and wondering if, if that question is being asked to someone who's white. It's having those conversations in the Sim Center um, that are focused on equity, and that has actually been one of the biggest things that our employees have signed up for because everybody wants to do a better job in this space. And then from a clinical perspective, really focused on eliminating disparities in maternal and infant care, um, childhood immunizations, and accelerating and expanding our efforts to eliminate disparities in chronic conditions and preventive screening. So in conclusion, I just wanna say that it's been such a pleasure to have this conversation today, and, um, and I think I've made five new friends. <laughs> a few of them, to be fair, I already knew before I walked in here, which is what's so great about the community. Um, but really, at Health Partners, what we recognize is we, knew what, we know what we do well, and we know that we come to the community work with a deep sense of cultural humility, and um, it really takes care, coverage, and the community to equate to better health. So I'm um, really happy to uh, answer any questions and look forward to talking to more of you during the happy hour. Thank you so much. Um, do we have maybe one question and then we will do um, happy hour networking? Um, okay, all the way up there. Hi, I'm actually a doctor and dermatologist at Regents Hospital. I didn't know you were speaking, but um, Hi. pleasure to work at your hospital. And um, the question that I have for you is we talk a lot about these upstream drivers of health and disease. And from a skin perspective, if everyone wore sunscreen, you know, my life would be a lot easier and, you know, our outcomes would be a lot better. But um, that's just not the way it works in the world. And I'm just wondering, what incentives are there in terms of these upstream drivers of health and disease, whether it's regulatory or financial, does, does the hospital have, or if you can speak even more generally, 
to prevent disease rather than having it kind of occur and then kind of treating it um, later on in its progression. Um, yeah, could you talk about some of these upstream drivers? And Yeah, yeah you know, um, well, a couple of things. When I was in undergrad, um, and I, I got my master's here, both the MHA program and the MBA school here at Carlson, but in my undergrad, um, education at the University of Utah in Salt Lake, we read this book, Prevention Versus Cure, and that was 1984. <laughs> um, and so um, while we've made some progress, we haven't made enough. You know, um, our society isn't wired to prevention very often until something goes wrong, uh, which is why I'm paying more attention to physical therapy related to my back at 57 than I did when I was 27, and that might have helped things. Um, so I don't have a good answer for you other than one of the things that we recognize is education by a trusted, delivered by someone you trust, goes further than, than anything else. And um, I will tell you that um, when COVID hit as an example and wanting to have people take the vaccine and having a lot of vaccine anxiety um, was I worked really hard to try and get connections to the community and I realized that unless I was a member of that community, no one was gonna listen. So I feel like the, the, the trust piece just comes back to me again and again. That um, one, one example I'll use is I worked with a primary care physician at the Como Clinic who was a big smoking cessation um, guru and he would talk to every single patient in his primary care network that was in his primary care panel that was smoking and saying, you know, here are the detrimental benefits of chronic smoking. And he walked into my office one day and he said, I talked with Joe Brown for 20 years. He wouldn't quit smoking. He walked into a cardiologist's office and in 10 minutes they had him quit. And I think this issue is, is that unless people really see the risk is real, they're gonna struggle to put the sunscreen on. And so I don't, I don't have a, I, I don't know, it's like, it's a big question. And I'm open if anyone else would like to answer this question. <laughs> um, but it's, I think it's a big challenge because um, just because we can tell people things, that doesn't mean they're gonna absorb it until they're ready to hear it. And so that was a ready to hear it moment for that primary care doc is that he needs to keep saying it because people, some people are listening um, but sometimes you have to have an imminent threat to your own personal safety to implement something. Thank you so much. So I want to thank all our speakers so much for, for your time and for being here on campus and coming and, and meeting our wonderful students. You know where to find us. Um, so just lots of common themes again that we heard, like I just keep kind of nerdy notes, but like some of the things I heard, just like looking internally and trust has been coming all the organizations we heard, they looked internally and, and thinking about how we build trust. There's a lot of um, mentions of community partnerships and co-creation that I heard, but it does come from that trust. It comes from that we're moving out of our comfort zones a little bit into figuring out these new ways of um, doing work and people and culture. And whenever you guys talked about technology, it was kind of really, um, you all said AI, <laughs> that's fine. Um, but you also always, always talked about sort of technology, but with a human touch in the end, which is also really a blending theme that I heard. And, um, and looking deeper into these statistics, like, yeah, we, we, we like the statistics, but really looking deeper and finding out and individualizing these communities and, and people and really understanding their needs. And uh, one thing, Megan, you said that's like really interesting is this, this small batch of ideas for like, I, I think I fully agree with that idea. And you know, it's just like, we can't always create these big ideas, but like we can always stack small batches of ideas. And, and that's like for our students too, you know, we talk about this. So, um, Thank you so much again for, for everything. And, you know, I, I do want to reiterate, you know, yes, we are the business school and, and, you know, we are really committed to, to thinking about health and business of healthcare is a minor that we started for un our undergraduate students. So most of the students you, you saw were from some of our classes and, and also from our research point of view too, like getting out of that comfort zone is, 
is really, really important for us as well. I do want to give a kudos to Heather Britt out there. Heather is the executive director of Wilder Research, and, and she can relate to me as I speak how wonderfully and you know intensively we've been working on an NIH proposal over the last three weeks and one more week to go. Very novel way of doing research. We're now a way of partnership where we're applying to be a health equity research hub with all the vulnerability that this is gonna be very competitive and you know we may not get this, for, but it's a huge award that we are going for, but it's, we're both learning on how to do this. How do we partner as a university uh, organization and a lot of interdisciplinary groups at the University of Minnesota with Wilder Research and Stratus Health and how do we bring capacity in research and research methods and, and how do we empower uh, community-led, not community-engaged, that's the new thing, community-led structural health equity interventions. So that's what we're going for. And I want to leave you with that. And I do want to also leave you with, we should do this more often. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> and big shout out to Becky. <laughs> big shout out. And Kellyanne and all our volunteers. Thank you so much. <laughs>